Uh, so yeah, here I'm here today to talk about how to grow distributed leadership, um, and this is leadership specifically in the context of highly collaborative, participatory, inclusive, transparent collaborations. Um, in a pyramid structure or in a hierarchy, I think people consider leadership to be concentrated at the top. There's more of a one-to-one -one co uh, correlation between positional authority and leadership. But what if your organization is shaped more like a network or an ecosystem or a community, as I think many, many of you, uh, your organizations might be? So this kind of leadership, it's not about position. It's not about a name on a business, a uh, name on a off a store or a title on a business card. It's the force that helps groups take collective action together. It moves toward coordination and away from entropy. And it doesn't have to be centralized in one person who's labeled as a leader. It can be distributed amongst many more people or everyone who's involved. Um, I've been thinking about this for, for several years and thinking about questions like, well, how do we grow leadership without bosses? Underst how do we understand leadership development in this alternative paradigm? Uh, how can we each as individuals grow as leaders if, if there's no ladder to climb and if it's a, com a completely differently shaped environment? So why, why am I interested in this? Why do I think this is important? Um, Maybe we don't need bosses. I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of people in this room share my aspiration to have equitable collaboration amongst peers and perhaps get rid of the idea of bosses. But I think we do need leadership. Uh, we need to be leaders in this movement because we've got to walk the talk. We have got to, if we want to have the impact in the world to make it more participatory, more inclusive, more transparent, that's how we have to be and how we have to lead ourselves internally in our own projects. Uh, and that's sort of prefiguring this commons future that we're collectively trying to create. Uh, and poor leadership is a huge risk. Um, I don't know about you, but I've seen many people burning out and projects imploding or just not going anywhere due to lack of leadership. So I think we need to take this on as a movement and a community. So how does this work? Um, like I said, it is that force of coordination away from entropy towards organization, but done through consent, not coercion. Collaboration, not dominance. Uh, and I'm going to talk in detail about how that actually works and how it really, the key is using power to then distribute power, using power that accrues to empower. So who am I? Who am I to be standing up here <laughs> spouting off about these ideas about leadership? I am a natural leader. And for a long time, I felt really funny about claiming that, about standing up and saying, I can do this leadership thing. But I've been this way since I was a child, so my mom tells me, <laughs> and I don't really think I've changed much. I, every time I, I join a group of people, I'm instantly drawn to help get everybody coordinated, help unblock people, help us get going where we collectively want to go. Um, but I, yeah, I always felt weird claiming that identity because in our culture, leadership has become so uh, coupled with hierarchical, authoritarian power, telling people what to do, and that's really not what I was interested in. I'm drawn to circles, so that's looked like housing cooperatives, or like as Dan introduced some of the projects that I've been working on uh, in Spiral, which is a big network of social entrepreneurs where we've been able to experiment with some quite radical uh, ways of co uh, doing distributed collaboration and distributed leadership and building open source software tools for this way of working. So I'm going to be using this metaphor of growing leadership, like growing a flower. Um, and I'm going to go through several different levels of distributed leadership and how they work and how we can understand them. Uh, but before we even start that, I want to talk about what I'm calling the soil. This is what we need before we even start, before we can even have a seed, we need the soil to put it in. And that is shared power. Without shared power, I don't think we can really go anywhere with shared leadership. Um, I think some people think, okay, great, we're not going to have a boss. That just means we won't name anybody boss, and there, problem solved. <laughs> but I think all of us probably uh, know that it's not as simple as that. Um, if you don't have explicit practices of distributing leadership and uh, ways for people to engage in, in uh, equitable, collaborative ways, you end up with these hidden hierarchies, implicit hierarchies, weird politics and power dynamics that aren't talked about. The seminal essay on this is The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which is written in the 1970s, but I reread it occasionally and think, okay, wow, that still really applies today. Um, I think many, yeah, many people here, anybody who's probably worked with other humans has been aware of some of these dynamics. Um, 
So to understand power, I think we need to recognize that it doesn't just come from a label or a job title. Power accrues to different people for lots of different reasons. It could be because maybe they originally started the thing and they have that status. It could be because of their uh, maybe ethnic background and how that intersects with how power works in their society or gender, age, skills, even just communication style. Uh, so many things go into how, how power flows, where does it accrue. Um, and I guess I want to say that power itself is not the problem. I would say power is like some sort of law of nature. It's inevitable in human groups. Uh, power dynamics will always exist. What's important is how we deal with power. Are we allowed to question power? Are we allowed to talk explicitly about power dynamics? And is, uh, the, is creating the power dynamics that work the way we want them to, is that our collective project? Uh, to have an effective critique of power, I think everybody needs a voice. And that's because many times it's the people without power in a given situation who have the most important perspective on power and, and what we need to do. So I think that those with power need to recognize that they have it, recognize when power is occurring to them, and turn around and figure out how to proactively distribute it. You cannot leave it on the shoulders of people who are not empowered to fix that dynamic. If we collectively are trying to do this distributed leadership thing, we all need to become aware of the power that we are holding and become aware of our toolbox for distributing it. And that's what I'm about to get into talking about. All right, so we've got the soil of shared power. Now we can sort of get started with the seed, which I would call self-leadership. This is where it all begins. Distributed leadership begins with leading yourself. If you are a skilled self-leader, I think you will have really good self-awareness, you practice professional and personal development, and you know, you understand yourself and the ways of working that work best for you, and you can communicate them to bring your best self and your best work to a collaboration. Uh, Self-leadership is about accountability. When you say yes, it means you're going to do it, and when you say no, it means you're not. You understand how to deliver and, and how to set boundaries. Um, you can identify and execute work on your own. You can come into a situation and look around and understand how to make yourself useful without necessarily always, always being told. So if you're an expert at self-leadership, I'd say you know how to follow. You know how to follow and when to follow, and followership is a skill set that, that you also work on. Um, I think an important part of that is getting the ego out of the way, that you, you, know, you can take instructions, you can ask for help, uh, we can be honest about these things. Um, and contribute genuinely to continuous improvement of how the group is working overall. Um, and just, just basically adapt and collaborate as an effective team member. So why are these skills of self-leadership important? It's because this is how we can build skills and credibility for the other types of leadership I'm about to talk about. Um, in consent-based leadership, what's really important is trust of those people around you and being on that learning journey together with those people because you're not aiming for power over, you're aiming for power with. So growing as a leader in this context is really a social journey. So when people see you practicing self-leadership, it starts to build that credibility. Okay, we've got the soil of shared power, the seed of self-leadership, and now we're going to get into the sprouts of leading others. And so this is, I think, um, what comes to mind for many people when you commonly hear the word leadership, um, and in the context of non-hierarchical, uh, consent-based organizations and communities, um, I think this is really about facilitation. Some people might call it servant leadership, bottom-up leadership. It's the, the art and science of facilitation to do coordination without hierarchy. If you are really skilled at this type of leadership, you have a knack for unblocking people, you have a passion for helping people to do their best work, you can understand how a given project might fit into the bigger picture or the bigger strategy. Um, skilled leaders at this level are really great at building teams. Um, you appreciate people's differences, really understanding the strength that comes in diversity and having a passion for welcoming that. Um, helping groups basically work together, delegate, communicate, collaborate in non-coercive ways. Uh, synthesizing all of these diverse perspectives into continuous improvement. And facilitating and inviting and welcoming and being genuinely curious about that ongoing conversation about power dynamics is a big part of this kind of leadership. Uh, using power that accrues to you to further distribute power. And that is an ongoing, constant process. And you are a mentor to people working at the level of self-leadership. So this is sort of the flip side of uh, 
when it might not be a good idea to be stepping up into this kind of leadership, and I think that developing uh, good skills for analyzing these kinds of situations is, is equally important, because this kind of leadership absolutely depends on having a mandate of the people that you are leading with and having their consent. So if you don't have that, you're not going to take that step, you're not going to put yourself out there as a leader, because leadership without positional authority without the backing of some non-consensual power or an institution is fundamentally an act of vulnerability because you are a peer who doesn't have extra power putting yourself out there to try to help the group get where it needs to go. Um, and if the culture or the people don't understand that act of vulnerability, it can be very easy to bring the baggage that I think all of us have from non-consensual power hierarchies, whether it's our families or school or uh, other workplaces, um, but if you bring those habits or those ways of working, perhaps railing against or subverting a peer leader, consensual leader, it's, it's, it can be really damaging. So I think understanding those dynamics and knowing when to step in and when not to step in is an important aspect. Next up is growing leadership. This is the meta level, essentially leading leaders. And the goal here is growing so much leadership that you make yourself obsolete. This is a leadership of creating systems that can operate without you, <laughs> because you can see that you don't have capacity for everything, that it's actually about growing leadership around you. Um, I think that when organizations or projects or movements get to a, a place of scale or perhaps momentum where it's growing beyond the capacity of the initial leaders, there comes a critical decision point. Either you're going to bring in middle management to increase leadership capacity and start constructing a pyramid and start constructing a hierarchy, or you're going to go down the growing distributed leadership pathway. And so here is the moment where those choices, I would say, come into play. Um, what this looks like if you choose the path of distributed leadership is intentionally crafting opportunities for other people to step up and learn Sometimes that means making mistakes, sometimes that means it's going to go slower or not as well as if you just did it yourself, but it's creating space for people who are on that journey of expanding their leadership capacity. Uh, and your role becomes much more about supporting them to grow as leaders. You do this because you see that long-term sustainability of this thing that you care about absolutely depends on nurturing leadership. Uh, it's basically succession planning for non-hierarchical organizations. What's going to happen when those initial leaders, they're tired or they want to go do something else or the thing just grows way beyond just their capacity? Um, you need all of these leaders to have been nurtured and welcomed and stepping up in order to get to that next phase. Um, and this is why you're thinking about leadership systemically. What are the leverage points? What are the educational pathways where people can come up as leaders? Uh, and what are the barriers maybe who's missing when you look at uh, who is stepping up as leaders. So, and that's about critiquing power at a systemic level. Uh, if the leadership pathway isn't accessible to everyone, if, that, if all the people who end, just happen to end up as leaders sort of look the same or come from the same background, then that means there are leadership seeds in your community left unsprouted. And finally, I want to come to this level of the pollen ecosystem leadership, and this is sort of the meta, meta level. If you are working across all of these levels of leadership and thinking beyond just your own community or project, I would say you are an ecosystem leader. Um, I have m many more questions than answers at this level, but in my thinking about these topics, I, I've come up with maybe some hunches or intuitions or things that I think maybe questions that ecosystem leaders might be asking themselves. How can we create catalysts to seed new collaborative communities? So this is, how, how do we scale, scale a movement that is not going to be a top-down movement? It's going to be a federated collaboration or an ecosystem-to-ecosystem -ecosystem collaboration. How do we support that network-to-network -network collaboration? How do we change societal power structures that determine the big questions about power dynamics in our lives and in our societies? How can we restructure our communities and cities and companies so that everyone can lead? How can we give more people access to that shared power that we talked about as the basis for everything? I 
think ecosystem leaders think about how can we welcome diversity at the level of different communities, different ecosystems, different subcultures. When it gets uh, to this really kind of complex and large scale level, it can be very tempting to kind of try to fit everyone in the same boxes so that it's easy to understand or coordinate them, but ecosystem leaders understand that it is in that diversity that the real opportunity and strength lies. So what processes, structures, what new ideas, what new ways of relating or communicating do we need to get to that next level of collective agency? What is the beginnings of that uh, new future or new paradigm that we're creating? So I hope that I have been able to give you some new vocabulary, maybe a useful mental model. Oftentimes when I come up here to give talks, I tend to stick to just telling my own story as it happened because I can definitely uh, authentically say I can speak to that, but this issue specifically has been such a passion of mine uh, over the last 10 years or so that I feel like I've, I've been finally ready to come up and say, yeah, this is how I think it is. So I very much hope that it's been useful to you on your leadership journey, and I look forward to being on that journey with all of you.